All right. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? Good afternoon. Thank you very, very much for uh, making some time on a Friday afternoon. Uh, obviously, a little bit amused to find that I'm now doing this three times. Um, and so uh, we've been given an hour uh, in order to, to get through this. Um, I propose that I try and uh, get through a little bit of material, tell you a little bit about who we are, what we're doing. Uh, big focus, I guess, on what we're doing just across the pond over in France, the opportunity that we think that this potentially opens up for, uh, for the island. Uh, but then I'd like to make sure that we maintain some time for, uh, for you to throw some questions at me. Uh, in, in many respects, you've been looking at, uh, at tidal power and all a lot longer than I have. Uh, and so you probably have uh, a more informed opinion on a bunch of different things. Uh, that said, I like this to be very interactive. So um, as I sort of go through, and it's roughly broken into a, a number of different sections, uh, I'll see whether I can sort of pause on my way through. I don't know I've got to turn this on somehow. Um, and where is the on button? There it is. I hope. No. Pause on. Not on. There we go. Broken into a number of sections, uh, and I'll try and pause at, uh, at, uh, at, at sort of the, uh, the, the, the natural breaks so that uh, I can see whether you've got any uh, direct questions to, uh, to ask me. Does it all make sense? Fabulous. Okay, so first and foremost, you know, who is Symec Atlantis Energy? Um, our heritage uh, is obviously in marine energy. And for those of you that have tracked our company for a period of time, it's been developing tidal power systems, so on the technology side, uh, as well as being one of the leading developers of tidal power projects uh, for the last 14 years. Uh, in 2014, it listed on the London AIM Stock Exchange, uh, it underwent a reverse takeover, which uh, some of you may have seen uh, during, uh, uh, during the course of this year. It completed, and hence the, the, the name change. And I'll take you through a little bit about the Symec Group. But we changed the name then from Atlantis to Symec Atlantis, which has given the, uh, the organisation now sort of a broader ch church to work with. And you'll see that we're into uh, a number of different forms of renewable marine energy, waste to energy, uh, hydro, pumped hydro storage, and different forms of storage. So the heritage very much is in... Uh, uh, in the marine energy sector, uh, we're probably best known for, uh, for the Magen project, and I'll take you through that specifically because, of course, uh, it's the largest operating tidal power array in the world. Uh, it's soon to be expanded upon, uh, and, of course, it's something that we've invested a hell of a lot of time, energy, and money into. So a brief snapshot across the, uh, across the group, obviously, tidal power in its origins. One of the more exciting areas that we do, not pertinent to you, is that we now uh, uh, acquire old coal-fired power stations. We shut them down so they don't use coal anymore. We turn them into a, uh, a waste to energy product. So actually we take non-recyclable plastics that would have ended up in landfill uh, and we use that then as a source of energy. So we're effectively then providing uh, uh, a, a solution for non-recyclable plastics as well as uh, getting rid of our coal-fired generators. That's just one of the things we do, but there's a bit of a selection across the company. And of course the history is the Magen project. Now one of the themes that you'll see here a lot is the, the sort of the, the large vessels which are very much in the oil and gas sector. And that's because a lot of us came from the oil and gas background. And so one of the sort of the great mysteries to debunk about tidal power is that in some way, shape or form, it's particularly technically challenging. And it's not. It gratuitously borrows its technology from other forms of generation. So you'll actually see that these are basically all underwater windmills. It's what all the designs now look like from the various suppliers. They're marinized underwater windmills. And all the connection that you see, the subsea connection, is all borrowed from the oil and gas market. And all of the subsea connection equipment that you see in power export is borrowed from the offshore wind market. So all this is really is an aggregation of different existing technologies which is put for the purpose of obviously harnessing the, uh, <coughs> the unlimited, almost limitless power of, uh, of the ocean. So we have uh, two different divisions. Um, we have our project development team uh, which is headquartered in Edinburgh uh, and then we have our um, turbine and engineering services division which is headquartered in Bristol. We also have turbine manufacturing facilities further north up in Invergordon. So we now actually do the, the full offshore construction end-to-end. Uh, -end. We don't outsource that anymore. And that's actually very interesting for, for a number of reasons. Before I go on to Magen specifically, because that's the area of interest, a little bit about the GFG Alliance for those that you don't know. Uh, so uh, GFG um, is basically made up of, uh, of four companies. Uh, CIMIC, which is an acronym for Shipping Infrastructure, Mining Energy and Commodities. Uh, a separate group then, which is the Banner brand, Liberty Steel and Aluminium. Uh, there is the Wylands Bank, so they actually own their own bank, Wylands Capital. And then Jahama, or the Jahama Estates, which I believe is the fifth largest private owner of real estate now in the UK. All run uh, by an enigmatic uh, Indian billionaire, uh, obviously of UK domicile, Sanjeev Gupta. 
uh, very, very prominent businessman, as you've seen, uh, has amassed a huge steel and aluminium empire over the last couple of years. Uh, has always been a strong advocate of, uh, of tidal power and uh, obviously recently now cemented by them taking a substantial 49% stake in, uh, in our company. That's, uh, that's important for a number of different reasons, not least of which, one, uh, they become a user of our power. So steel and aluminium industries are obviously heavily energy intensive. And as a result, they want to source all of their energy, if they can, from green elements. And so they're building our platform with them to provide them with energy. Why is that relevant in this context? They've recently bought the Dunkirk aluminium facility in France. Uh, that's a big user of power. I believe it's the second uh, largest user, industrial user of power in France. And of course, then we get to write power purchase agreements. We're actually selling the power into, uh, into their facilities. So it becomes very, very important in the French strategy. And why are we currently sitting here today? Why did the French opportunity arise? This becomes part of it. I'll, I'll make a copy of this uh, presentation available. So this is just sort of giving you an idea of the scale rather than me going through everything line by line. This isn't probably the interesting part. But it's just to give you the context that this is a big company. This does end-to-end -end products. It does obviously anything from generating the electricity, producing the steel right the way through to complex engineering and, and producing a finished product in the end in the aviation, aeronautics or automobile industries. So the Magen project, and, and this of course probably gives us the sort of the credentials, if you like, to be sitting in front of you today. Magen was important for a number of reasons in its, uh, in its time. And remember that we are now, uh, if we, we revert back a few years, we're A, pre-Brexit, and B, more importantly, at a time when tidal power was enjoying substantial support from the UK government through its uh, Five Rock scheme, which effectively gave it a subsidy for being able to develop the first scale uh, uh, tidal power projects in the, in the UK. But it was more than that. Atlantis was the first company that brought together the Crown Estate, the UK government and the Scottish government to all co-invest alongside each other, alongside Atlantis, in order to deliver what is the world's largest tidal power project in the first phase. It was a £51 million close. Uh, it had both debt and equity instruments that were provided by government, as well as obviously the Crown Estate. And that sort of faith, I guess, that, uh, that you see uh, put inside Atlantis to be custodians of substantial amounts of taxpayers' money in the Crown Estate, has really manifested itself now in the fact that almost 60% of all of the uh, what are called agreements for leases, so the sort of the rights to develop marine power in the UK, is under the control of, uh, of Atlantis. So uh, Northern Ireland, Wales, England, uh, and of course Scotland. So you see over 600 megawatts of, uh, of development pipeline in Scotland. So we brought all of these people together to make a project happen, and we were the only people that have successfully been able to do that. Now, as I said before, Tidal power has taken a long time to get done. And uh, you know that all sort of the, the sort of the, the key to any uh, success in engineering is simplicity. So the number of moving parts now inside a, uh, a tidal turbine is rapidly reducing. And it's a bit like the electric vehicle industry compared to combustion engines. The new cars that are built, the electric vehicles have got 12 or 13 key components. A combustion engine has thousands. These turbines now are going to what we call permanent magnet generators. So they're not the old induction coil motors anymore. You're going to brushless gearboxes, effectively meaning they don't have proper gearing inside them anymore. Um, <clears throat> and more importantly, we're getting very, very fast because of these subsea connections uh, in the ability to be able to deploy them quickly. So I don't know whether you follow us on social media, but you would have seen that our construction team were able to install a turbine uh, this summer uh, in under one hour. So they got, they, they, they've got it down to about 56 minutes to be able to install a turbine off the deck and onto its foundation, which is then connected back to grid super fast. And this is all done via a subsea mating system. Effectively, is a wet mate. We don't use any divers. Everything is robotic. The only people that, in, in, that are involved in installing these turbines is the crane operator on the vessel uh, <clears throat> and the guy who's actually controlling the, uh, the overall vessel called the DP operator. No one else is involved. And that's a very important part of, well, of course, for occupational health and safety. You've got to remember as well that <clears throat> we have a, uh, a situation which is very beneficial to tidal power in that the oil and gas market has gone through five to six years of severe downturn, which means that the price of vessels have, have plummeted. So when we first started this, you know, we were probably paying 65, 70, and in fact, some extreme cases, 80,000 pounds a day for a construction vessel. Now you're paying 10 to 15 maximum. These are for the highest spec vessels, things that we would have never been able to afford. And by making the installation time reduce so much, it used to take us three weeks to install a turbine. Now being able to do it in one tide means you're using less vessel time. Once again, very important because it's just constantly reducing costs. So the thing to keep in the back of your mind about tidal power 
is that it is not technically challenging, it's just a function of cost. You've got to get the cost down to make it competitive. And if we get it competitive, it gets adopted all over the place. So it's a function of scale and cost. This is not a massive engineering feat. Um, <clears throat> so we've, uh, we, we've, we've used every type of vessel that you could possibly imagine from jack-up barges uh, right the way through to our big construction DP vessels. We crew these, so our Bristol team actually hire the vessels, run the cranes, run the installation procedures, run the occupational health and safety offshore. We do the full nine yards. Um, <clears throat> they're big bits of kit, and this is very much harking back to our oil and gas background. So you'll see all of these. So these are, these are amazing vessels. They are incredibly intelligent. They typically have at least five what we call ROVs, so robotically operated vehicles on board. We use both ROVs, which have a tether, and we use AUVs, you know, which don't have a tether. So it's like an like a underwater drone. So all of the work that you see that, that, is, that is done these days is pretty much done by robots. Uh, of course, obviously, you need uh, a lot of human help to actually manufacture the turbines in the first place. But the point is, it's getting safe, and it's getting fast, and it's getting easier. But it still needs scale. So these are just obviously uh, some, some nice shots of the, um, uh, you know, of, of the system and the turbines. The, the design of these turbines now is, is, is virtually standard across the industry. Everybody is basically a three-bladed turbine, which looks a lot like an underwater windmill. The standardisation is now coming in that it doesn't matter whether you buy a turbine from us, Lockheed Martin, if you buy it from Andritz, Kawasaki, they pretty much all look the same, but they fit. They're installed the same way, so it's sort of ubiquitous. So if you have a look at the Magen project, we buy some turbines from ourselves, and we buy some from other people. It's good for the warranties, it's good for reliability, and it gives you some tension, of course, in your tendering process. Basically means that if someone's turbine doesn't work, you can kick them off, and you can go and buy someone else's. So this is, uh, this is obviously us showing lots of photographs of our wonderful turbines, but this has already been superseded. So just like the offshore wind market, where turbines have just grown exponentially in size, uh, this 1.5 megawatt system has already been superseded, and so the new French project and the new expansion programs we have on Maygen will be having a larger 2 megawatt turbine deployed, which is uh, an Atlantis built. Um, <clears throat> so I mean, here's all the things that matter, right? At the end of the day, uh, it's a, the number of electrons that go onto the grid dictates how much you get paid. Now, under the current regime, these are very lucrative uh, turbines. Uh, because we get that subsidy, which is the five rocks in the UK, each one of these turbines earns £100,000 of revenue per month each. And, of course, this is highly, highly predictable generation. So the level of predictability is what gives tidal power its huge advantage. Because unlike wind, unlike solar, which have intermittency problems, it's entirely predictable. So we can tell you, or we tell our bankers, or we can tell our energy traders, exactly what each turbine will generate, broken down to 15 minute increments, for 25 years in advance, at what we call P90, a probability of 90%. So basically what we call firm, you know exactly, and that's, as you well know, you know exactly when the tide's coming in, the tide's coming out. So this is the sort of the, the, the beautiful profile, and it won't mean a lot to you, but if you're an energy trader, this is a thing of beauty. Because it's a sinusoidal wave, and it says we know exactly when a turbine's going in and coming out, and it's behaving exactly like it should do. Let me pause there before I leave Majin and see if anyone's got any uh, questions around uh, around that particular project, or more importantly, uh, anything about uh, Cymec, Atlantis, the GFG Group, or me personally. Can I so, ask what strength of tides your Majin is uh, operating in right now? Mm. Um, obviously, it varies. Peak, peak is probably around about six to seven knots. So you don't want to put turbines in the highest flow locations. Because water is 800 times denser than air, if you try and put a turbine in, a, in the highest flow location, it's akin to putting a wind turbine in a hurricane. So it's not the highest velocity that you want, it's just constant velocity. We'd much rather be in three or four knots, which is just constantly going, than something that rips up really quickly to eight knots and then drops away quickly. But operating parameters, it cuts in, at 1.1 knots, that's when it starts operating, and it will cut out at 8 knots. And do you feel confident you could anchor these to our seabed in the race? Oh, yeah. At the spring tides could be as strong as 10 knots, certainly 9, 10 knots. Yeah, I mean, so that, that's, that's not the challenge. The, the rollers are the challenge. So if you look at the Magen site, uh, you can imagine, and you've all been underwater, when a wave passes over top, it drags a lot with it. So this huge drag force. The, the, the winter swells that we get through Majen, you can, you know, it's well documented, you can get 16, 17 foot rollers. 
if you want to have anything that's going to pull uh, a foundation off or a turbine off, it'd be that. And we've been through some of the most severe storms and, uh, and obviously that ain't budge. So we're, we're, we're highly confident. The technical challenges uh, genuinely don't scare us anymore. It's been there, we've done that. Uh, it's scale and cost. Thank you. Sir? A couple of questions. Um, what's the actual size of the turbine to put on top of the, the blade, if you like? Yeah. And the secondary question, how do you keep the... Um structure clean from marine growth? Excellent question. So this particular one, 25 metres from the bottom to the top tip. It's a, this one has an 18 metre rotor diameter. Uh, the new turbines will have a 21 metre rotor diameter. So another, another couple of metres on, uh, on that. Um, there is obviously an epoxy and anti-foul that, uh, that goes on the, uh, the outside. What's really interesting on the foundation structure is you actually put a light trickle charge over the entire, uh, entire th so basically, it's like any electric shock if you go down as a barnacle. So you put a couple of milliamp milliamps across the entire thing and it goes whee every time it touches it and so uh, it keeps them nice and clean. Okay. So will that be detrimental to the fishing grounds? No, not at all. So I mean, we obviously have operated these for, uh, for years and years and years and years and quite the opposite. You see these become very large reefs and uh, we've seen more marine life around where we are rather than less. At first sight, your turbine blades are more exposed and more vulnerable than the ones Open Hydro produced within the stator. You've no doubt learned from Open Hydro. Would you care to comment on that? Not particularly, because obviously none of us You're understood better, for... No, it's not necessarily been better, because none of us understood for a decade how that turbine worked. And I'm not sure whether they did ever work. But um, all we know is that rather than trying to recreate the wheel, pardon the pun, um, you're just taking very, very simple, uh, tried and tested generation technology, which has been around for 40 years, and we've marinized it. And there's nothing to worry about in terms of exposure because obviously these are quite the opposite. You don't want anything sort of being able to be entrapped on its way through. So you'll see from our perspective, whether it's fishing nets, right the way through obviously yeah, to charismatic megafauna. Is it steel or GLP or? So it depends on, on suppliers, they're all different. So Andritz uh, are very much come from a hydro background and they fashion their blades out of steel. So they're a solid steel single piece, much like a samurai sword, if you know what I mean. It's a single piece. Um, wonderful, heavy, uh, very reliable. Ours uh, are made from uh, a glass reinforced uh, plastic. So it's effectively like a, a very clever epoxy. Um, some people obviously make their straight out of uh, glass, glass fiber. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, ours is, I think we, we prefer ours because they're lighter, easier to handle, um, and you get less pitting, which occurs on some of the metal blades. But of course, I'm sure the metal blade guys would stand up here and say theirs are the, are the best bit. Thank you. Question in the front? Yeah, how many, um, how many turbines have you got on the Major project, and how much distance between them just now? Yeah, so it's interesting. So the, so the first phase is four turbines, it's about to go to six. So just installing another, another two, and then that's going up again by, by another 84 megawatts. So there's another 40 going in. Um, so common convention was when we started, uh, and I would say we started, this is like 10 years ago, that when you design an array, it's a lot like a wind turbine uh, farm, that you have to start having serious amount of spacing in between each so that turbulence doesn't affect one turbine to the next. So everyone started spacing them out and, and, and there was wonderful academic theories around two diameters one way and one diameter the other that you had to be spaced out. Turns out that's all complete codswallop. The best thing you can possibly do is have them clustered really closely together because you actually get what's called the bulge effect. So you get water that actually builds up and wants to push past, which is actually much better for the efficiencies of the turbine. So they are, and this is a great advantage of tidal power, <coughs> tiny amounts of seabed relate to huge amounts of generation. So... 400 megawatts, which means 250,000 homes worth of generation at Majin, fits into uh, three square kilometres. So a tiny amount of seabed. What about maintenance and life? Uh, 25 years. So the turbine suppliers are required to provide a 25 year maintenance life and they're allowed to retrieve their turbines once every five years. Good. Are they in a constant state of development? Can I just ask that? Well, I think everyone always, you know, everyone, everyone is always trying to strive to do the next best thing. Um, that said, most of it's around reliability. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, you've got tweakings around the margins now. So rather than fundamentally trying to test a bit of kit and see whether it works, you've got people now that are maybe trying to make a more efficient drivetrain. We get people that are approaches all the time saying they've got a better gearbox. So from that perspective, yeah, I mean, there's always R&D, but it's not fundamentally radically changing what it looks like. <clears throat> 
So, Normandy or Jolien, uh, we made an announcement uh, to the market uh, a week ago or so that we had taken the unprecedented step of uh, forming a joint venture directly with um, <clears throat> the, uh, the region of Normandy. And this is, this is big for us for a number of reasons. But first and foremost, why did it come about? It came about perversely because of Brexit. And <clears throat> whilst Brexit has been terrible for the UK market, there's no hiding for that. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's in unhelpful in many ways. The UK taxpayer had spent the best part of £450 million developing R&D, uh, doing the, doing the R&D expenditure. This is the expensive stuff, uh, the riskiest stuff, in order to develop what is the marine power energy uh, industry today. When Brexit happened, um, <clears throat> all the lobbying work that we'd been doing with the European Commission, and when I say we, this is the industry, had uh, very successfully, because we enjoy wonderful support from the European Commission and the European Investment Bank, we had effectively garnered a new fund, which is called InnoFin, and that InnoFin fund's got about 450 million euros in it for marine energy projects. Now, when it was designed, it was pre-Brexit, and three or at least three, if not four, of the largest projects were meant to be UK projects. And when Brexit happened, the access to that instantly got shut. France seized on the opportunity and saw that without having to then hit the state up for their own funding, they could use the existing concessions that are obviously in the, uh, in the waters of, uh, of Normandy. They could use the feed-in tariff, which is already in place, and they could access a big chunk of capital without having any competition from the UK and then be able to roll out their industry. So effectively, uh, on one side, the UK have funded and taken all the risk out of it. These guys then get to come through and roll it all out. And in reality, that's what's happened. And of course, we have actually now brokered an announcement, hopefully, which will be made in a, in a couple of weeks' time, where, the, U, where the, the Scottish government and the French government will come together and acknowledge that this is actually going to be a partnership going forward. Scotland can't develop the way it wanted to, obviously, and it voted to remain. There will be political point scoring, of course, because you know, Normandy would love nothing more than to be able to align themselves with, uh, obviously, the, uh, you know, the ideologies of, of Edward, the Prime Minister. And, of course, you'll be well aware that uh, you know, he was the, the ex-mayor of Le Havre. And so, in terms of Le Havre and Sherbrooke, uh, these are areas where they want to see turbines built, which is exactly what we'll be doing. So we've formed the joint venture, which is really exciting. It's obviously myself and President Moran. Um, <clears throat> and this joint venture will be co-funded between Atlantis and the investment fund uh, in, uh, in Normandy. We'll be looking to build the world's largest tidal power array there. And this is the real reason why I'm sitting here today and have been invited to, uh, to present to you. Uh, we are not pitching, we're not asking, we're not presenting anything for you except an opportunity to try and use the amazing gains that we've made in France, given that it's so close in its proximity, and to see whether it's something that you think that the community would want to try and piggyback on. Because we're doing France anyway, and you just happen to have incredible resource. And you also happen to be a stone's throw away from where we're going to be doing all this. Now, of course, if we're going to be spending the time, the money, the effort, and in investing in the infrastructure to be doing the Normandy side, why wouldn't we be doing the same thing over here? So it's a question for you that I don't expect an answer from, and this will take months and months of discussion. But this is the sort of the catalyst for being here today. It's because of President Moran. It's because of the, the will, obviously, of, the, uh, of the, the region in Normandy to see tidal power developed. It's access to European capital. And it's the ability for us to use, I hate to say it, the open hydro facility, which the state paid 150 million uh, euros for to be developed in Cherbourg, which is currently sitting idle. And so we have the ability to be able to now take that facility uh, and start manufacturing turbines. So I've got three of the biggest legs up, you can imagine. A free facility already built for me, a free swing and a big chunk of European funding, a feed-in tariff that's already in place, and concessions that have already been awarded. It's as good as it gets. So this is not of much interest to you, but to say that you will never have an opportunity in such close proximity to piggyback on our efforts. This is money that's being spent on a wonderful facility in Cherbourg, which will be manufacturing bits of kit. And if you're doing that, I want scale. To get my costs down, I need as many turbines as possible. And obviously we're looking to do up to one gigawatt. So that's 500 turbines on the Normandy side. There's at least that again in Alderney's waters. So I keep reiterating the same point. Someone else is footing the bill to do a whole bunch of work here. Think about ways that you can try and piggyback on the, uh, on the back of this. Wonderful new facility, and you can imagine that from a French perspective, this is going in now at a very, very uh, welcome time. Lots of manufacturing jobs. That opens up new opportunities. You know, we've had various meetings today with different people on the island. 
I mean, imagine if we can take a bunch of, you know, of, uh, of graduates that are coming out and start putting them through our apprenticeship schemes, learning, starting to learn on how to develop and service a turbine, how to deploy a turbine, how to maintain and, and observe a turbine, and then that puts them in great stead, obviously, for any developments, whether it's with us or someone else, that you may choose to do in the future. So, Alderney. The one thing I'm not going to do is talk specifically around absolute locations because this is day one of a conversation with the community. We haven't had any commercial engagement whatsoever. All we're saying is that there is wonderful resource, we're doing stuff in France, so maybe we can start talking about different ways we can work together. Now, all of this you'll know better than me. You've got great resource. Let's just call that uh, sort of accepted, if you know what I mean. Um, what I am interested in is this concept of scale, so I keep coming back to it. In order for tidal power to be relevant, and everyone will ask the question, well, why isn't tidal power everywhere in the world? If it's so simple and you've sorted all the problems out, and why isn't it as prevalent as solar and as wind? There are two answers to that. Number one, you've got to remember that the solar industry and the wind industry enjoyed at least 15 years globally of feed-in tariff subsidies and concessions. And that allows them to go big and to go to scale. And the tidal power industry had never enjoyed that. It's at the beginning of that journey. So the exciting part about it is, you're basically where solar and wind was uh, 10 to 15 years ago, which means all the best sites in the world are yet to be developed. So then why aren't they being developed? Well, you need a feed-in tariff. We had that in the UK and we started developing. We put 100 million pounds into it. And luckily, obviously, Atlantis was the one company, even though there were so many people bidding and trying to get in there, and we were the successful people to deliver it. You'll see it in France now because they've got a feed-in tariff. Why isn't it getting developed at scale or why are we sitting here talking to you in Alderney? The simple reality is that you are sitting on not just resource, but you're in close proximity, less than 80 miles to the UK, less than 20 miles to France. If you look at the Canadian resource, the Russian resource, it's bigger than yours, but it's 3,000 miles away from anyone that can use it. So in terms of having a couple of the key ingredients, which is where can I actually send this power, you've got it. And that's why we're interested, and obviously that's why uh, you, you'll see France developing. Now with scale comes price. We need to be relevant. And I can tell you that no government in the world has an issue with tidal power as long as it's the right price. And so we need to get scale. We're not saying that we're cheap to start. And we know that, and we've already sorted that problem out because we've got European funding in place. So you can sort of wipe your brow and think, thank God someone else has sorted that bit out. You get interested now at scale, which is where it comes in. And then, of course, we have the opportunity to, uh, to potentially even supersize this current project uh, because we know, in theory, there's probably as much as three gigawatts that are available in the, uh, the waters surrounding, uh, surrounding Albany. So there's a couple of key things here that I want you to, um, to, to, to understand. So, fine, one to three gigawatts, you could argue there's more, I don't care. I mean, I'll be uh, old and in a wheelchair by the time there's three gigawatts uh, you know, developed, so that's more than enough for us to chew on. And remember that just one gigawatt, and we've publicly uh, disclosed this, one gigawatt of installed capacity in, in the French region is about a 3.3 billion euro investment. So roughly around about 3 billion euros per gigawatt. Two, this is the opportunity for economies of scale that we we're talking about. Uh, and this is a really important point because you won't be able to, in my opinion, and maybe you'll have other developers talk to you, you won't see anyone to be able to develop at this scale, which then gives you competitively priced power. Minimal visual pollution, obviously, is a theme that's come up over and over and over again in all of our discussions. So just to absolutely eliminate uh, any point of conjecture, Atlantis systems won't touch the shore. You'll have a, an array of turbines about three miles offshore. They aggregate onto a subsea hub, which is located about 20 miles offshore in about 150 metres of water. And then there's one power export cable that comes off that and we can go some to the UK and some to France. You won't actually see it. It's one of the hardest things in the world to market to investors because you can take them to your site and it's bugger all to see. So <clears throat> everything will be subsea, you won't see it. And the one, of course, discussion that we will have will be naturally with a fisherman on any sort of cable route. But that's it. There's no offshore transformer platform unless we go really, really big. Uh, but uh, that's just not going to happen in, uh, in sort of our, our time scales or, or our lifetime. Now, when I say you can go either way, um, the interesting thing is that each one of our hubs is around about 200 megawatts. Um, and in that 200 megawatts, that means that basically for one gigawatt, you've got five hubs. And one thing that we do know about politics is that it changes frequently and often. And so as a result, uh, you know, we would be advocating to you that you contemplate putting two or three of your pods to the UK and two or three of your pods back to France. Hedge your bets. So you've got that sort of flexibility that, uh, that you're able to do that. The other thing is that I'm going to talk to you about quite a strange concept because 
The jam tomorrow, uh, you know, story is one that I can understand is frustrating, which is it looks good, looks great. You're going to do a whole bunch of stuff in France. When's it actually going to be manifesting itself here on the island? When do we see the economic benefit? So I want to talk to you about data in a second as well. Grid connection, I understand, is, uh, is contentious. Um, and once again, to be very clear, Atlantis owns its own uh, power export cables, whether onshore or offshore. We own them, we develop them. It's how we de-risk our projects. We need it for our financing. So we don't partner with anyone, we don't do anything, on, we just own the subsea connections. Um, of course, anything that we do here is, 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 is understanding this notion that from a tourism perspective, but of course from the generations of families that have lived here, we can't have any sort of visual pollution. So success for us is that we install everything and you haven't seen a single thing, except obviously during the construction phase, where you'll see vessels on the horizon as they're working. Um, <clears throat> as I said before, we, we have clusters. So this is this concept of the subsea hub, and I'll show you what a subsea hub looks like. But that'll be in 150 odd metres of water. You won't know it. You'll be able to pass over your boat and you wouldn't even have a clue that you're going over the top of an array. Because remember, at any stage, you'll have at least 12, if not 15 metres of water between you and a tidal array anyway. And that's at LAT, so that's once every, well, astrological, I think it's once every 50 years. So you'll have a lot of, uh, lot, of, lot of space. So we can step it up to 132 kV and then take that by a, what's called HVDC technology, so it's just a big power cable, and run that either to the UK or, uh, or to France. And if you say, well, I don't know whether that cable exists, I mean, it is so prevalent now that one of our shareholders, the Norwegian utility Statcraft, you know, it gave up trying to sell its hydropower in the north of, uh, of Norway, because basically there's so much hydropower there, it's free. So instead, they take their hydros, they run a subsea cable 850 miles down to Amsterdam, and they trade their hydros live on the Amsterdam grid. So 80 miles is a walk in the park. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, what we're saying is that if we need to do five cables, we'll need to do some economic studies. Of course we will. I can't tell you today that it's absolutely categorically going to be economically feasible to do that. We suspect it is, but we've done a lot of work in France. We've spent months and months and months doing all the techno-economically uh, economic feasibility analysis. We're very prepared to do that in all these waters, but we are never going to be presumptuous to assume that you even want us here. If after the community has a discussion and you figure out whether you want to try and trust tidal power again, go through that sort of healing process of some of the stuff that's happened historically, then what we're saying to you is we'd be delighted to invest and tell you what a techno-economic uh, feasibility study would look like and the results of it, and we'll be honest. And we'd like to think that there's going to be a good result. We could also finish that after six months, spend a couple million quid doing it, and also tell you that's a garbage idea, but at least we know. <clears throat> now this is, this is going to be strange, but uh, I want you to bear with me. One of, the, one of the interesting elements for us is how do we do something on the island that's meaningful? Um, because that obviously garners trust, right? So the action's not words, the theory. And the easiest thing for us to do, by the way, is to install a tidal turbine and run it to the island. That's, that's you know, well within the, uh, the, the wit of man. And we can do that potentially combining it with some storage, and it's a really interesting angle for you. But what I'm more interested in is, you know, whether I don't know whether any of you follow our project on the Orkney Islands, but we've installed, uh, or I say we, Microsoft, have installed the world's first subsea data center. So it's been operating now for a year, and this is uh, a full data center located in the fall of Warness in Orkney Islands, and it operates as a full data center. And it's powered from marine energy. So what's fascinating here is that the demand for uh, data, center, data center and, and computer crunching uh, capacity is exponentially growing. It's through the roof. So, contemplate this. You're able to install, you, you, you've, you have unusually ownership of your seabed, so you can put as many data centers as you want. Now, each one of these fits on a 40, on, a, uh, uh, on the back of a semi-articulated lorry, so they're not big bits of kit. You can put as many of these down on the seabed as you feel that you would like to do, and of course, data is a lot easier to export than power, because a data cable is simple and it can go anywhere, and you don't have to worry about a grid connection. But even more interesting, it's then your decision as to what sort of industry you'd like to attract with all of your, uh, your power, uh, sorry, with your, your processing capabilities. Now, the reason that subsea data centers and why has Microsoft built uh, the first subsea data center? It's all about reducing the power requirements. These things are terribly power hungry. So by putting them in the ocean, you effectively have a, a natural heat exchanger. So they use about 20% of what a regular data center would use in terms of energy, because it's just using the constant cooling from the uh, surrounding environment. So you can combine tidal power with, with subsea data centers, and that's something you can get up and running tomorrow. You have all the ingredients, once again, to be able to make a decision to do that. You have no R&D, because Microsoft have spent their millions developing with us, with, uh, sorry, with, uh, uh, with, with themselves. 
We've deployed these in Scotland, they work, they're a great bit of kit, and they're something that the island could really sink its teeth into because it opens up new industries. So it's something to contemplate because data is faster to get online, of course, than power. Uh, this is all about the battle for cost of energy, and after these slides I'll, uh, I'll pause for a, for, for a few questions. Um, <clears throat> how are we getting tidal power cheaper? So people will say, I hear that tidal power is expensive. Damn right it is. And people will say, oh, you know, I think solar apparently is cheaper than coal. It's getting there. They've got the benefit of scale, we've got the benefit of predictability. And we are getting rapidly down the cost curve. So when anyone tells you that tidal power is too expensive, consider this. When we started the Magen project in 2014, the cost of tidal power was 305 pounds a megawatt hour. In the 2017 CFD auctions, so they're the auctions the UK government uh, runs in order to sell power, we bid at 150 pounds, so half the price. In the 2019 CFD auctions next year, we need to bid between 60 to 80 pounds. So I challenge you to find any source of generation on the planet which has come down the cost curve that quickly without the benefit of wide scale subsidies that uh, solar or wind had. You know, if we were all developing solar power 15 years ago in, in Spain, we would have got $400 a megawatt hour as our feed-in tariff. So this is, this is a, a very, very impressive cost reduction. The other big thing just comes in bunching a bunch of turbines together. Historically, we've put one power export cable per turbine. Horribly inefficient, really safe. In the early days, we wanted to do it that way because it was so safe. Now, we're able to aggregate multiple turbines excuse me, and we're able to, uh, to, to have, uh, therefore, a hell of a lot less cable and a hell of a lot less vessel time, because vessel time's expensive. Finally, you go to monopiles. By installing a monopile, as opposed to a 1,500 tonne gravity base, which is what we've traditionally used, we save 90% on steel. So that's not good, actually, for my strategic shareholder who wants to sell us a lot of steel, but from our cost of energy, uh, you're seeing massive cost reductions just through using monopiles. Good old, boring monopiles. So this is the cost curve that we've got to achieve. And to get down here, I need the scale. I know that I sound like a broken record, but that's part of the reason that obviously we're appealing to, to the French government to go very large, which is a gigawatt. And while we're presenting you with the opportunity to contemplate how adding the territorial waters of Alderney would provide scale. And that scale then delivers power, which is materially cheaper than nuclear in the UK, materially cheaper than offshore wind in France. Before I get into the benefits for the island, let me pause and see whether there are any questions. Data centres, costs, reliabilities, Do you grid connection. There being a, a need for a substantial workforce on the old island of Albany, and over what time scale would that be? Really depends on which avenue you go down. So, <clears throat> I've got a slide coming up on benefits to the uh, to the island, which speaks specifically around the different categories of employment that we see in other projects. Um, and you can loosely think about it in three ways. Huge amount of upfront traffic on the island during the construction phase. For two years, you've got two to 300 men and women pretty much living on the island, going back and forth every day, eating, drinking, spending and sleeping. And obviously that then goes away. The full scale operation and maintenance will be in Cherbourg, obviously, but on the island we'll maintain uh, what they call a, a, a sort of the operations and maintenance and uh, monitoring centers. And so we keep things like an inventory of, uh, of essential spare parts because you want rapid response capability um, for, uh, for, for spare parts. You have constant monitoring requirements uh, of the, uh, from an environmental perspective. And you've also got on-island on technicians uh, who can do sort of uh, the work you can imagine that you're able to do on site without having to take a turbine back to get entirely refurbed. Uh, so that, that, that's sort of a workforce. And then on top of that, we would probably end up putting a blade, uh, so the rotor blade, um, uh, effectively like a, a maintenance shop because you can you, you get issues with the leading edges and you want to keep them nice and clean and sharp so occasionally you rotate out the rotor blades and they get done new epoxy coatings, new paintings, new whatever else so I mean once again it's a, uh, it's a new facility that we would need um, so you, I've got a slide specific to that but the answer is yes we will see it uh, I'm not going to lie to you and say it's going to triple the, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, population of the island but for a period of time you know, you'll see really really substantial increases in in, in foot traffic, and we've we've seen that obviously in you know, places like Caithness, which actually struggled to handle it, not enough hotels and and uh, and whatever else. Aside from the um, large uh, scale infrastructure that you would like to achieve, mm. would it be possible for one, two, or however many turbines to, to power the island solely, so we, we can bring our own electricity costs down? Is 
that at all possible so that there's just one or two specific turbines dealing with sure. that requirement? Uh, that's what I'm saying. I mean, that's, that's the easiest thing to solve. Um, <clears throat> There's no, yeah, there's just no, no, simple, no, no simpler answer. The answer is yes. Uh, you know, if, the, if that's, that's of interest, obviously I'm aware that you pay a very, very high rate. Have you had conversations with our AEL, all the electricity, to see about current turbines or the new turbines that I understand we're going to be getting are um, compatible with the type of uh, energy? Yeah, I mean, so, we, so, so to be clear, we haven't had commercial negotiations, but we've had sort of in principle and technical and sort of the what is in the art of the possible discussions with uh, James Lancaster, who's very, very supportive. Um, and the simple answer is yes. I mean, you know, it is, it is 100% feasible. And what part of the offer that I made this morning to, to him is, we're already doing these programs on places like Orkney, on places like uh, Isla. So we can take all of the knowledge that we know about out of power off island grid uh, and just bring that, that, you know, that, that technology directly on island. And what sort of time frame would that be? I mean, it's it's I'm interesting. Gonna, I'm asking, am I going to see it in my lifetime? Should you negotiate a deal with our states? It's a, it's a really interesting sort of mindset because um, you know I find a lot of people on the island ask me, when do you think this is going to happen? You've got to remember that you're 100% masters of your own destiny. You pay, I think it's, you know, some, the long run marginal cost of generation is more than 300 pounds a megawatt hour. If that's true, then all you do is you issue a power purchase agreement for 250 and then tell people to go and, go and build that turbine. I mean, you control your own seabed. You've got access to your own grid. You can do it tomorrow if you want. I'll, I'll, you know, it'll take me six months to deliver a turbine if we ordered a brand new one, or if you want a second hand one, I can get out in three months. <laughs> we don't want second hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim, sorry, can I ask? Just out of interest, if last year it was proposed on a connectivity side with FAD that um, all renewable energy generated by whatever source would have to go through their cable. If we had signed that, would have made that made this project impossible? Yeah. As you said, it would have made this impossible. Yeah, we just wouldn't have we wouldn't have dealt here. I mean we can't we can't operate under those those circumstances. It's not what we do. We need to control power access. It's like being captive. Imagine owning an oil well and someone else owns the pipeline and you can't do it or they could switch it off. You won't get banked. Right. You you had a meeting this morning with the states members and uh, how did they react, and was the chief executive at the meeting? I can confirm that the chief executive was not at the meeting, um, and all of those that attended, uh, of course, I can't mind read, but their body language suggested that they were very supportive uh, and were reassured by, I guess, our messaging, that uh, they asked me, and they kept asking me, what do you want? I was like, I don't want anything. I want you to tell me what you want, and then we'll figure out whether we can help you or not. So it was very positive, um, but of course I can't speak for them directly. Okay. Yeah. For the different size turbines, like for this island, we would probably need a smaller scale just to provide energy for our island alone. Can you do like a compartmentalized small unit for all the needs for us to make money with? Or just yeah. work like okay. Go big or go home. You, you, just, you just need to, you need to keep the same sort of, I mean, for a production line to work, they're all going to be two megawatts. And it's a perfect size, to be honest. You want, you want two megs. This island apparently is about 1.4-ish megs peak and, and rolls at about 400-ish uh, kilowatt hours. So, I mean, from that perspective, yeah, I mean, that's a perfect size turbine. One of those bad boys and, and you're done. And then you've got all of the, you know, the investment that you've already made, uh, which provides all the backup. So you've sort of got no downside, right? Because if you've got a turbine issue, then bang, you're, you're apparently going to be up to four megs of backup there anyway which then starts saying, well, you know, what else could you use the power for, which is now going back to my data centre ideas. But, yeah. I take all the power coming, sure, DC, isn't it? Aye. It is HVDC. Yeah, correct. Stepped up to 132 kV. Yeah. What about royalties? So I, I have to be, you know, I keep reiterating the point. We've had absolutely no commercial engagement whatsoever. This is This is a... This is purely, uh, from our perspective, um, a, uh, a sort of a meet and greet and present opportunity. Um, so I can't comment on whether the right modality of engagement is royalties or whatever. I mean, I presented this morning, and I'll show you uh, in, uh, uh, in some coming slides, three or four different models that we have. So I've got a direct joint venture and formed a company with uh, the region of Normandy. That's one where they've got obviously all the minority and majority shareholder protection rights that one would want. Uh, you can enter into a royalty agreement, which is easy to understand, of course. Uh, I would argue potentially not the most lucrative, but royalties are great because, of course, once you've got royalties, you can then lend against those if you want to go and do in central infrastructure on the island. 
You can enter into leases. Leases for me are archaic. They're a bit of a hark back to the, to the sort of the oil and gas industry. And just getting paid for rent and real estate is a pretty unoriginal way to approach life, but it's also you know, pretty, pretty sensible. Uh, I mean, my, my position this morning, to the, even to the Chamber of Commerce, was start your own company up. You don't need me. If you've got enough intelligent people on the island, you should be doing it and run a tender yourself. Now, I appreciate, you know, I appreciate that that could be, you know, it could be laughable, but at the same time, why not, right? I mean, it's, it's, it, it, it's been done before. You can take a lot of this as not quite cookie cutter, but take other examples that have worked around the world and apply them to your own model. So as I said, I kept getting asked this morning, what do you want? I, I don't want anything. I'm interested to see the best way to engage. In terms of the infrastructure, you've told us how many people will probably be employed in doing all this work, it's part of Albany. What sort of area would they need to, what, what would they need, what would they need in Albany to do what you've done? <clears throat> it's a function of what you want them to be um, in terms of their presence. So the construction crews don't need anything. So every night, I don't know whether you've seen what a tidal array looks like or what an offshore wind farm looks like, but every morning at 8 o'clock, the fast, the fast uh, boats take 180 people out to work and they work all day offshore and then they come back again. So that doesn't need any infrastructure except for beds and beers. Um, <clears throat> if you're going to start looking at a small O&M base, ideally, for our own reasons, to reduce capex, you're going to look at other existing facilities and sheds that are being unused. And if there's not, then you can build them. But they're not large. But then if you place, you know, like, for example, we may be told... We're delighted to have you as a partner, but we want to see you build X, Y, and Z. Now, I don't know whether I can afford X, Y, and Z yet, but assuming that we can, then we'll go and build X, Y, and Z because you might have some sort of local content requirement. So these are all the things we need to think through. So my answer is anywhere from absolutely nothing, uh, except for obviously just access, better, better access, and air transport and everything is obviously a bit of an issue, but that's, that's access, right the way through to the full scale where we can build an O&M facility in and in a, uh, as a set of blade manufacturing and repair facility, which would require a big, long shed somewhere. So it's an interesting segue, obviously, the benefits for the island, right? So, Sorry, can I just oh, yes. data centres? Hmm. Are there any in the Magian project? No, so no. Are there any anywhere in the world? Yeah, right? yeah, so, yeah, Orkney. And, and is there any environmental impact? Of them? None whatsoever. So go onto the, pro go onto the, the Microsoft website. Uh, the project's called Project Natick, N-A-T-I-C-K. They've got live cameras. You'll see everything operating. Uh, yeah, and it's, 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 it's fully funded by Microsoft. And of course, amazing that's happening in an island community that we're associated with up in the north of Scotland, even though they've got all the different places around the world, they elected to do it obviously with us because we're the most subsea experience. So we're very keen um, <clears throat> to try and make Alderney a bit of a case study. So this comes back, I think, to the gentleman's question before about can you do it here? Um, so I mean, my idea would be that you should be looking to try and make uh, more out of the sort of the marketing efforts about going off grid. It's proven very, very lucrative. We work in other islands, uh, as I said, like uh, Isla. Uh, it's slightly different, but it's starting to use um, the power of Diageo and the, and the whiskey distilleries there uh, in order to take tidal power combined with either a vanadium flow battery or a, uh, or a natural gas fuel cell to take the island off grid and to then to be able to market itself as obviously 100% powered by the ocean, which then works well for Beaumont and Isla and their whiskey distilleries and, of course, great marketing for the island. Uh, you've seen, uh, I think it's uh, either Lewis or Shetland, um, obviously up in, uh, in Scotland. Uh, it's just announced that it's going uh, with a, another tidal developer, not us, and they're partnered with Tesla, and they're putting a Tesla battery on there. So these are all things that are, you're not blazing trails, which is nice, it's expensive quite often to be first, let other people make the expensive mistakes, pick up the best ones, go and apply it to your own island. So future revenue streams, obviously we just sort of cut across some of that before, um, and this is different ways obviously, so this constant theme, and you'll think that it's the throwaway line, but you know, if we don't harness this environment in an environmentally and obviously economically responsible way, you'll kick us off. Or you'll kick whoever it is that, you know, that you're, uh, you're, you're developing with. Um, obviously, we want to try and see different ways that, uh, that you get comfortable with very sort of long-term uh, uh, revenue streams. Because it's not just the day-to-day -day recurring revenue that's important. Uh, as you're well aware, the ability for you to be able to expand your own aspirations for infrastructure will be severely you know, um, underpinned and enhanced if you can demonstrate long-term reliable capital. The sovereign debt rating goes up. It just means you can do a whole bunch more. So yeah, we don't, we don't mind what the ownership model is. And we've, we've, we've said this morning to the Chamber uh, of Commerce as well as obviously to the commissioners, we'll share with you the different ownership models. Have a look at them, see which ones you like. Co-ownership I really like, but for example, in Region Normandy, and you'll see this come out in an announcement shortly, we're only allowed to own 25% of the company. 
I'm, I'm not delighted, but fine. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's their natural resource. It's, they want to control a whole bunch of it. I've got minority shareholder protections. They can't, you know, they can't do uh, things that are in, in the, in the, in, not, not in our best interest, but they maintain control. Now, of course, that's a different kettle of fish I appreciate because that's a government. They've got a whole bunch of people and they've got resource and they, they put a whole bunch of staff on there. So it's non-trivial, but I'm just saying that there are very different ways. We don't have to come in and own the whole shooting match. And to be clear, I'd much prefer you ring up and say, hey, we're launching a tender. Alderney Tile Power, Tidal Power Company is owned by the people and we'd like your best price for 500 turbines, please. And we'd like them delivered next Tuesday and we'll give you a price. But I suspect that that's probably not in the art of the possible. Um, right, so employment. This is what we went through before. A couple of key questions. Uh, sorry, key uh, items. So we've got the environmental impact and monitoring. So that's constant, right? So you need all the feedback. So before we even start, you've got to have all of the baseline data, which is what is the diving birds, the salinity, the frequency that's generated subsea so that you don't do anything with migrating mammals. Uh, all of that needs to obviously be monitored so that you've got data to compare it against. Then every three months, you've got to go and submit. Well, certainly either in the UK or France, you've got to keep submitting your performance data so that you know there's no detrimental effects. That's much better if it's done obviously on island rather than flying people on and off the entire time. The monitoring station I spoke about, nice little uh, you know, temperature controlled element. It's got all of your smart diagnostic equipment in there. Uh, it basically means that if there are certain alarms that go off, you can do a bunch of diagnostic work very, very close. You can be out in the array in 10 minutes, weather permitting. And obviously that's very helpful then, which goes back to our main technical base in Bristol and they help do diagnostics. So you get a monitoring station. The construction crews have a profound impact because one thing they do is they work hard, they basically then go home, drink 100 pounds worth of beer a night and go to sleep and then wake up again and do it all over again. And they do that for three months on, one month off. So very good for, for, for the local economy. Um, ongoing ops and maintenance, as I said, that's all part of the sort of the, uh, the observation work. Uh, inventory storage, so we need essentials, things, big things like gearboxes, permanent magnet generators. They'll probably be stored on island because if you need to get them very quickly, because the vessels come and we do all of the work on the vessels. But of course, if it's sitting there on, in inventory, we grab it quickly on a fast boat and we can bring it out. So you have inventory management. We like the training and apprenticeships programs because you know, effectively, if we're gonna deliver something in three or four years time, we're gonna start training people now on our bits of kit. So you know, we already have other people spending time under sort of the academy uh, pretense in, uh, in, in Scotland at the NIG Energy Park, uh, who are learning now for projects in Japan or projects in South Korea. Uh, or aspirational projects that, uh, that they may have developing. We welcome that because it's a great way, obviously, for people to get the learning curve and then they start, you know, sort of propagating the great gospel of the Lord, which is, uh, which is Atlantis. Um, media coverage is a big thing, right? So let's just say that you did decide to go ahead and do the first subsea data centre and you were opening it up to a new market. You will attract a huge amount of media attention. Uh, that can only be a good thing, of course, as long as it's controlled well, but it brings, and you may not want this, by the way, but assuming that you do want more uh, exposure in the tourism market, then we find the media coverage has been a very big thing. Super, super important for places like Caithness, up in the very north of Scotland, difficult to get to. Typically only people that, you know, going up to ride to John and Groats would actually bother going there. Uh, and now it's much more of a tourism destination. People see it. It's been on anything from the BBC to National Geographic to David Attenborough. And that's really, really uh, helpful for them. And then, of course, there's the, uh, the, the tourism bump. So that's the, uh, that's the sort of the, the presentation. I'm going to finish the slides by saying, listen, this is the start of a conversation. And it'll take us weeks, if not months, to garner the feedback from all of you and to understand which bits we, we think that we've, we've, we've covered, which bits we haven't, what are the problems with our strategy. Uh, it's, it's going to be an iterative process. So all we're going to do is listen initially and see what you think. And you may well decide, you know what, we've got a whole bunch of other things we'd rather be doing right now. Don't, don't, don't annoy us. If that happens, it, it happens, and we'll find somewhere else to go. Um, but you, know, you may also turn around and say it's worthwhile and we need to understand the next steps. I don't want to tell you what the next steps are. I want you to tell me what the next steps are because I'm not sitting here trying to tell you how to run uh, your economy. Um, we don't have all the answers right now and we need to spend some money to find them. Uh, and we can, we're happy to do that. But obviously, once we know what the biggest problems are, uh, we can set all that out on a big whiteboard and that allows us to go and find solutions. So we can do that really early rather than presenting you something. You go, hey, that. And you go, well, didn't tell me. So that's, uh, that's an important part. Environmental impact and pollution, that goes without saying, and, uh, and I've been through that ultimate, but I know I understand how important this is to the island. Actions, not words. I know that you know, there, there's, there's some people that'll be pretty sort of sick of hearing charlatans stand up and talking about tidal energy. And we were blocked out of being, you know, and having these conversations for the best part of the last decade, really. And it's taken a long time for us to be sort of invited back here, and we're delighted to, to be here and to be having this conversation. But only by delivering and doing things and spending some money and doing all those sort of 
fundamental building blocks where we rebuild your trust. So that's what we've got to do. And of course, work on a model. There is no right model for how you go about building a private partnership for private public partnership for a title power project. And you might decide that you just want it really simple, really transparent, um, <clears throat> you know, which is a royalty. You might decide that, no, we are going to go and incorporate a company. And we're going to help it raise capital and debt. And we're going to use all the assets that we've got, any sort of sovereign rating, and we want to stand our corner. And you might just say, bugger it, just, we're going to put the blocks up for sale. I don't know. We'll help you. We're happy to talk to you. But we don't want to tell you what the answer is. You need to figure that out for yourselves. Would and that is the communications office here that, uh, to create two-way dialogue in the future? Yeah, I think it's a very good idea. Yeah, I think it's a very good idea. Uh, and it's also very good to probably, you know, sort of cut rumours off at the pass, uh, stamp on, you know, incorrect information. Stamp on rumours. Stamp on rumours. You know, and just, yeah, just, just provide a repository of sort of real information, factual information. Right. Uh, but it's a good idea. Thanks. And so there are other communities, rather like us, who are having to make these decisions. Uh, and this is another way we could find out what is the best way for us to. I agree. And I offered that as well to the, to the, you know, to the commissioners. Go and spend some time in Normandy. Go and spend some time in, in Caith Ness. Go and spend some time in any of our projects. We'll facilitate it all. Sit down, have a meeting, have a discussion. Arrive at your own decisions, but absolutely use our experience. It's cost us a hell of a lot of money. We've made a bunch of mistakes. So and you should be able to benefit from that. Um, you knowing that we are sitting on a potential gold mine with the tidal resource we have. Yeah. Where have you been? <laughs> well, we weren't allowed to talk to you. I mean, we, we weren't allowed. I mean, we, we were, we were just, we, no, no one wanted to talk to us. It was blocked. I mean, we were blocked out. By who? I'm not pointing any names. It was just impossible to come in because, I mean, everything was tied up. So there was no point in coming. It's, mm. it's a bit like walking into someone's house and saying, why can't I own this? Oh, it's not yours. Have license. Yeah, it was just, well, yeah. Whatever. It's nice to see you here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.